You got doctors, lawyers, people that drive uh, UPS trucks. I love the sound and the smell. When it comes to going outside in the dead of a Wyoming winter, this is what probably comes to mind. However, we're eager to learn what else Wyoming folks do when hunting season ends and temperatures drop into the negative digits. We tag along as they experience nature in new ways. This is known as a transceiver. Sculpt ice, ride sleds, and do all kinds of other strange and new things in this episode of Wyoming Folks. Our first stop is at Boyson Reservoir to check out what people were doing on the windy ice. It's cold, it's windy. I don't know what possesses these people to do this, but uh, we're gonna find out. How do you guys drill the hole? True to Wyoming weather, the wind knocked out all usable sound and our fearless cameraman was so worried about falling through the ice that he didn't stay long. There's a crack about the size of a, a ruler right there. It kept cracking. Despite being repeatedly assured that the ice was thick enough to hold several times his weight, he just wouldn't shut up uh, about it. Heard the ice cracking. I could hear it cracking underneath my feet, kind of like a... In short, we really didn't learn anything new. Ice fishing looks like a very cold activity best left to the few, the proud, and the well-insulated. That was really creepy. I'm really, really, really glad to be off of the ice. Our quest to find people doing something cool with ice was about to be rewarded. Usually they're like, is that really ice? <laughs> <laughs> Most people learned it in culinary school. No, I taught myself. While most people can claim to have built a snowman, few have taken winter artwork to the level that Kevin and Lori Petty have. In culinary school, they teach them to carve with um, chisels. Big old long chisels, about three hundred dollars. And... Kevin's a power guy, man. All power, all the way. <laughs> Basically, the ice blocks are made in what we call a Kleinbell machine. That's what makes it crystal clear. So that if you get cracks or any of that in there when you're carving, they'll just take off on you. This is a machine that can make a 40 inch by 20 inch by 10 inch thick block of ice. And basically, the water is circulating the entire time that it's in the freezing process. And so you actually make a block a little bit bigger than 10 inches, so that all the impurities come out and they're all floating on top. So you suck all that water off, and then you can pull the whole block of ice out. surfaces on them so they will adhere to another block being put on top of it and then we wet that surface either with an iron or with water and then adhere the other block on top and then from there um, basically we have to slush it our mortar that we use instead of concrete is a mixture of snow and water We always send them drafts of what we're going to do, designs, and so they have like a choice of different things that they might want to do um, in different sizes. So, I mean, we use that same picture and we blow it up to however many blocks of ice that we're carving with so that it does look exactly like the picture that we had sent them originally. And then we make that into a template where that's cut out of cardboard and then we have a permanent pattern for the next time we got to do that.
at the end of the night when everybody's had a good time and everything, somebody's got to pull that 200 pound ice carving off of there. <laughs> The big difference is between dirt biking and snowmobiling, when you fall off your snow machine, you don't get hurt normally. In our exploration of the great snow-covered outdoors, we have to give a nod to what usually comes to mind in terms of winter sport. With over 2,000 miles of groomed trails, you can ride a snowmobile almost halfway across the state of Wyoming. What serves as basic transportation for some, and has even had military and rescue applications, has now become a major winter activity across America. We asked a longtime snowmobiler what early snowmobiling was like back in the day. Rough. <laughs> you, were, you, you rode them out of 10 miles, four or five miles and worked on them. Four or five miles and worked on them. Then you towed them out. <laughs> People that don't understand tend to think that we're a bunch of crazy maniacs that are out there running around sometimes. Uh, and sometimes we get it portrayed that way and that's certainly not the truth. In fact, we were surprised at the responses we got when asking snowmobilers why they chose to spend their weekends with snow up to their necks. I love the family time. Um, it's a huge family sport and we just go out and do it. It's, it's a lot of bonding time, it's a lot of our a lot of our family days, we just go ride. Beautiful country, uh, especially in winter. And the trails and stuff that we enjoy in Wyoming take us right through the heart of some very beautiful and incredible sights. And, and it's just a, an awesome time to see it. There's a, a good physical component to it, too. They get good exercise. We spend a lot of time standing up, working back and forth. and, and uh, it's pretty strenuous by the end of the day, throwing around a five, six hundred pound machine. And if you're out riding four wheelers, you're, not, you're eating dust all the time. On a snowmobile, you're not eating no dust. It's just a fun sport. I mean, it, it's a way to go out and, and work off your energy. I mean, it, if you've never done it, you're really missing out. the Dubois dog sled races and we started this race 12 years ago they just want to go and eat up the trail before I love the trail this is my favorite race because you just once you drop into those trees you're going so fast Where the dog teams go you know, 15 to 25 miles an hour. You don't want to stop and your team's just loping as fast as they can. What started as a way for indigenous people to go from point A to point B has developed into an entire subculture with huge races and big competitions. We talked to these folks about dogs, sledding, and what it means to be a musher. Um, the musher term comes from, uh, I believe it's French, and it was March. It was, and then it just turned into this mush, um, although most, I don't know any mushers, in fact, that use that to their dogs, <laughs> they, but it is still called mushing dogs. We have the 21 mile race and then we have the 8 mile race. And then a 3 mile novice, 3 mile kids race and a 3 mile ski touring race. Since dog sleds don't have reins, the only way to get your team to turn right, left or stop is by voice commands. This makes the sport all the more interesting. Um, hike is go, and then woe is stop, but that doesn't always happen. Um, and then G is right, and haw is left. And then um, they also learn an on by command, which just teaches them to go on by a moose in the trail or pass another team without um, getting into a fight or going off the trail. 
You have to keep your balance, especially downhill. You do have to break. Um, I try to run up a lot of the hills uh, just to keep them moving. I was living in an area in 1984 that was uh, only accessible by snowmobile or skiing or dog sledding. And so I, um, I just ordered a dog sled and hooked up the dogs that I had at the time were Great Danes and I hooked them up to that dog sled and they took me in and out of that place uh, which was four miles in and four miles out. Um, I always wanted a husky since I was a kid and so then I got one and she had so much energy we had to figure out something for her to do so we started um, we were in town at the time so we just started hooking her up to our cells on rollerblades and taught her to pull. I was about eight years old when I started I would hook a dog up to my bike or my skis and just go just my house dog. It doesn't. He doesn't have to be any certain kind of dog. It's just gotta want to go and please you. A any dog can be, you know, trained to pull a sled. There's a, a dog from uh, Hurricane Tr Katrina that is in the ski during race, and he's doing great. We asked these mushers what their secret to success is. Uh, a lot of time and commitment, a lot of time spending with them in the dog yard, uh, genetics, uh, the, the feeding program, the time that you spend with them, uh, the training definitely, uh, uh, putting the miles on them, getting them ready, prepared for races. I'm out there like six times a week right, running them and training them and you just got to keep them healthy and keep them happy and want to go fast. Yeah. Feed them and pet them and scratch them between the ears a lot. Wow. You know, any any time you run sled dogs in Wyoming, the trail conditions change so much, and uh, the the weather is totally unpredictable. You you can get on top of this mountain here, and it's just uh, the wind blowing, it's just a ground storm. Can't see anything. Can't hardly see your lead dogs, and. Uh, you just uh, just hope for the best, and the dogs pull you through and make all the right decisions, and uh, you make it on the on the, on your way. The worst trail I remember was it was slushy and raining and like 20 degrees, and that's the worst weather we've been in. <laughs> um, one time I was about 10 years old, and I was coming down the Hill City Mountain, and uh, the snow was blowing so bad, and I forgot my goggles. I froze my eyelashes shut, and I couldn't see. And when I came in, my mom was all worried about me. I had to go sit in the truck, and my mom had to unhook my team. It was pretty scary, because I couldn't see at all. B is just, it's, it's magic. Uh, you get out there, it's quiet. Y'all, all you hear are the dogs, you know, the, the dogs' pads on the, on the snow. You don't hear them barking like this because they're happy, they're running. The other thing, too, I really like about it is being outside in the winter. Instead of just sitting inside, I feel much healthier. I'm um, going through fast through the trees and everything and just being with my dogs. It's really fun. Uh, I, I just think it's a magic way to uh, go across the countryside. Um, it's like the old horse and sleigh. It's, it's very much the same. If you like the idea of dog sledding, but you don't want a wolf pack living in your backyard, there are alternatives. Oh, it's just a great way to spend time outside and with your dog, and the people involved are lovely. If you're anywhere decent at all on skis and you want to train a dog, it's it's just a, it's a load of fun. Ski joring is a mix of dog sledding and cross country skiing. We just uh, entertain ourselves outside. Yeah, my name's Oli, and I'm named after Olas Muri, a famous naturalist. And um, I want to be a professional sled dog, and uh, my brother's here, but I like chickens, and I try to do really good for my mom.
Because <laughs> she takes good care of me and lets me sleep on the bed too. It went well. It was a really fun track, uh, exciting, and I had two dogs with me, so we did it pretty fast. And I used to live over in Jackson, and uh, you could only take the dogs in the park if they were on harness. So I started just getting harness and hooking them up and taking them with my skis just for fun. Um, I got some Alaskan Malamutes, and, and I've been a skier my whole life, so I started hooking the dogs up and training them. And then it wasn't until the races here that I really started doing some ski touring. Had a few wrecks, but not too bad all overall. Came in pretty fast. Uh, we had, uh, I don't know how, three or four crashes yesterday on my race. We were running into sled dogs, running into other ski drawers. Everybody is courteous. Everybody realizes that you can't lose your patience because it doesn't help the dog. And you just, you know, you can get tangled up and you just have to stop and be patient and untangle yourselves and and uh, and restart. Just to get them enthused about going again. Now, some of the people have professional sled dogs, and that's great, but some, you know, even they're hard to handle. If you got too much power in front of you, staying on top of your skis and falling will take a lot of extra time away from your race time. That's yeah, beautiful. Um, you can cover more territory. Once a dog is well trained, it takes patience to train the dog, but you can get further back in than most people go if you're doing overnight camps and stuff. Um, I will quite often tie a sled to myself, a little like pulp sled, and my tent and all my gear, and the dogs will haul me in. And you can go back in and camp overnight. And you can get further than you can get on your own, so you get back and see a lot more. Go! Yeah, go, 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 go! <laughs> go, go, go! <laughs> 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 For those of you who might not be adept at skiing, if perhaps your dog is too lazy to ski drawer, we offer a sensible alternative. Yeah. We take Skip, the computer network specialist, and that guy who was so afraid of the ice before, and ply them to an ancient means of transportation. Although no one appears to be sure, snowshoes may have originated over 4,000 years ago and have been used by rugged cultures all over the globe. So what are you doing there, Skip? Putting on my snow pants. The modern snowshoe hasn't deviated much from the ancient varieties. Now made with aluminum and plastic, the same principle applies in that a wider footprint spreads your weight over a greater surface area, keeping this from happening to you. Modern snowshoes also have metal cleats and flexible bindings, making them easier to use. Our videographer should not be wearing jeans.